uh, the uh, question was not math mathematics has confronted, I think, every mathematician at one time or another. And uh, at those moments, one can only um, uh, feel uh, that if I, if I could feel, if I were a biologist, I would have an easy answer. There's a single word, life. And what? that would encompass uh, protein uh, uh, synthesis. It would encompass studies of elephants and uh, medical uh, applications as well. Life, or if, it were, if I were an economist, it could be exchange. With mathematics, it's very hard to see what unifying anchor it has. On the other hand, if you're a practicing mathematician and uh, I can be contradicted, which would also be interesting uh, if uh, people think otherwise, um, that um, there really is a unifying anchor to mathematics that um, uh, is defies vocabulary dis description, but one simply has a, a feeling, what is it? And uh, there are some, uh, there's a certain sociology to the people who uh, offer uh, responses to this question. For example, um, the mathematician Gelfand once said, let me see if I can remember it, um, that uh, the thing that produces the unity of mathematics, and therefore the notion that it is one subject, is the intense, and this is what he says, simplicity, um, precision, beauty, and crazy ideas, <laughs> and says that that identifies it with music. <laughs> well, that's his, his claim. Uh, there are other, uh, uh, let's say, sociological schools of thought about uh, the unity of mathematics. And um, one of them can be uh, uh, encompassed by language. Some people say, um, well, it's the language. It's the well-definedness of uh, of uh, what we're, uh, of, of, of our utterances. It's the, um, the it's some aspect of language, but usually well-definedness, in fact, uh, the logical um, manner of um, the way in which our sentences succeed one after the other in what purports to be a demonstration of something. Anyway, it occurred to me that it might be great to have a, uh, general uh, jam session, this uh, discussion about what, uh, what constitutes mathematics. And uh, I thought that uh, if unity is one of the starter words, it's not necessarily the finishing one, beauty might be another. And for that reason, uh, I, I, I called it unity and beauty. Um, but uh, with beauty, uh, it's, that opens up a, uh, a new and a further topic of what is beauty. Uh, now, there is someone who... Just one simple question <coughs> after another. <laughs> one simple question after another. And there uh, is someone who wrote the... Um, the, the blurb for this meeting um, mentioned, and he put in the blurb, I don't know who it was who did it, uh, for this meeting. I will uh, tell you if your comments are positive about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was my comments, but uh, there is an addition, yeah, I which I thought was really good, uh, probably better than my comments. Did you write it? Okay, very good. Uh, it's, um, uh, the, there's the mention of this 18th century um, a uh, philosopher, philosopher commentator, uh, Yves, uh, Yves Marie André, who uh, uh, <laughs> quotes what I understand to be an, uh, a lost uh, treatise of Saint Augustine, 
who claims, and I think in none of his uh, collected mm -hmm. works did I find this claim, that, uh, that beauty and unity are unified. That is to say, the, mm -hmm. the, the source and form of beauty has to be uh, uh, found in aspects of unity. Anyway, so that's the reason for the subject, and I, I, this is supposed to be an unprepared thing, and this is what I've just given, it's <laughs> sort of a semi-prepared thing. I'll never do that again, and uh, just let, let it go. <laughs> well, the, the, my first thought of when I saw the title yeah. was that beauty and unity are have relate to mathematics in two very different ways. So I think mm. I do think mathematics is unified in some way that we can explore. And but when you when we call mathematics beautiful, I think that's um, that's an amphiboly. It's it, it's using a term from one domain and and just making an analogy. Mm. I've always had a sort of pet peeve about people who said, "Oh, that mathematics is so beautiful." Because it seems to me different from the beauty of, of art. For so how, how is it different? <laughs> well, for one thing, it's, it's not... It's, <laughs> so I, it, this may be my lack of imagination, but I, mm -hmm. I, for me, mathematics is not sensuous. You know, it doesn't... It, it's, it's ideas. No? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're ideas, or they're, or they're the things I write down on the paper. Yep. Yeah, but I don't have a... Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> I don't. Uh, Einstein always said that, that when he had a really good idea, that often when he was shaving, he would have to watch out because he would cut himself. Mm -hmm. The hairs would stand up. There would be a kind of uh, physical thrill. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the sensuous. That's... Houseman, too, would import poets. Yeah. That there is a kind of goosebump Well, it has a physical effect. side, a physical yeah. side to it. So you, I I'm not saying it, we shouldn't yeah. use the word beauty about mm -hmm. mathematics, but but it, but it's but it's an analogy, as opposed to unity, which I find mm -hmm. is a direct, direct description of the, of the subject. But I don't know what's yeah. unified about it yet. I, which I plan is, to learn that from. <laughs> which is why uh, I, I latched on to your uh, comment about mm -hmm. Augustine's uh, attempt to connect the two. I of thought course, that your comments about mathematics, how maybe difficult to define mathematics in one simple stroke, that it reminds you, what you said could also be said about beauty. In a sense, right? So question, how far can you extend it? How far can you extend mathematics mm -hmm. on the one hand? How far can you extend the concept of beauty on the other? One, one could make a sociological uh, experiment to see whether people actually just use the word beautiful for mathematics. I, mean, I, know, I know that in um, uh, academic English um, uh, the community of uh, literary scholarship at one point, sort of post-Ruskin, uh, people decided never to use the word beauty <laughs> when they talked about uh, an object of literature. And um, it's now, there's now a, uh, a revisiting of that, that it's very difficult to talk about uh, a domain in which people think it's beautiful without being able to talk about it. And isn't there also the, the, the problem that Proust talks about in his book that he argues that each true artist introduces not just beauty but a new kind of beauty and enables people to see in fact things as beautiful that they had not before regarded as beautiful but even on the contrary as ugly or devoid of any kind of anything like that so that it's not merely that there's a single kind of beauty but there might be a changing that the change of beauty or the opening up of a new domain as having a kind of beauty that was never before recognized itself is important let me ask you a question have you seen something in mathematics that you thought was ugly? Oh, sure. 
I wanted to ask. <laughs> well, in fact, there are, in, and you, you know it too, actually, uh, uh, Sare has something that he called the ugly lemma. And it was, <laughs> it was truly ugly for various reasons. But the thing is, one can't give too objective reason to beauty if one has read the critique of judgment. <laughs> I mean, it's not an objective issue. It's a, it's a subjective. Uh, Kant wanted to sort of elevate it to a universally subjective status. That is to say, if you feel that it's beautiful, uh, that, that really suggests that you also think all of humanity will feel that it's beautiful because you have some sort of model of humanity in your, in your mental faculties, and you can test, <laughs> test this model. Does my model of humanity feel that this is beautiful, not just me? And I think that's the, 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 that, that the ugly lemma, it's not, it shouldn't be called the ugly lemma. It should be said that the people who read that lemma feel in their universally subjective ways that it's ugly, which might uh, start the question, start the, uh, change the question to what is ugly rather than <laughs> what is beauty. And the story of the ugly duckling suggests that the ugliness itself could become dear and beautiful in a certain way, which itself would be a new kind of beauty, because it wouldn't be a meditation anymore on the ugliness of the duckling or the lemma, but how it was rejected, how it had a difficult origin, how it was hated by so many people, and then it was embraced. Not this moment. Not, no. not, this, moment. Okay. Well, not this moment. No. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah. But I, I want to pick up from your suggestion that we do a sociological experiment, which we're not going to do, and I'm not in a position to do it. But I did, uh, since the role was not to prepare, of course, I, prepare. I, I prepared. <laughs> oh. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the marks of a, one of the marks of a mathematician is not to follow the rules. <laughs> or to follow the rules of one's choosing. But the, uh, the, the, so I prepared by, because I was under the impression that this, this uh, connection of beauty and mathematics may be a a preoccupation of Western, the Western tradition of mathematics, and I looked into it, and I inquired, and I, the conclusion, although I'm certainly not, uh, I don't have an exhaustive knowledge of the literature, is that in the Arabic tradition there was no association of beauty and mathematics, or, the, or rather the, the association went in the other direction, that is to say beauty <laughs> was characterized in mathematical terms, which, also, which is also seen in Aristotle in some sense taken from that. Then in uh, the Hindu tradition, there, was, uh, there are words uh, that the word, the closest word uh, that approximates the, the, the notion of, of beauty is ananda, which means joy. The word beautiful mm. never a, appears in the, uh, in, in the, at least in the, in the classic literature. And then I asked one of my mm. uh, colleagues, who was a Chinese mathematician, whether when Mathematic Chinese mathematicians are speaking to each other. Do they ever say, this is beautiful, and what word do they use? Well, there are, in fact, they, there are two words for beautiful. As a matter of fact, the English language is particularly poor in, in vocabulary for beauty, it turns out. <laughs> but uh, uh, Arabic is, has, has many different synonyms. Uh, but there's the word may, which means hmm. handsome, mm -hmm. uh, or good-looking, or and for an attractive face. And then for a proof, when they want to say that the proof is beautiful, they use mei miao, and miao, uh, excuse my pronunciation, <laughs> uh, which, and miao is a word that means clever. So it's, you, you would not refer to a mathematical mm. proof as beautiful unless you also say mm. clever. Mm. But what, about, what about the ancient Greeks, though, where we're getting all... Yeah, well, you would know the answer to that. Yeah, well, I was, but uh, I thought maybe you had researched... Well, I found, <laughs> I found, nothing, I found nothing about... But it would have to be that when you think that, I mean, in the, I think this goes to the question of the unity of mathematics. Unity more because unity, for yeah. the Greeks, mathematics was not a single thing. Right. In, in the quadrivium, you have arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy, and they're sisters. Yeah. Now, how could beauty not be an issue for them? Because music was there. Not to speak of astronomy, but 
The fact that they were not separate subjects of mathematics as such did not exist. And it had two sisters. And it, they were sisters, but not the same, the same and not the same. And mm -hmm. so, and at least for them, it was not unified, but there was something beautiful in having these two sisters there. So that it, it seems to me, if we're going to think about it, this, this is an immortal family. So that it's still here. These, these goddesses are still present, even though there may not be much talked about. And they've had children, which are the modern sciences and maybe modern mathematics itself. But the family always, always speaks, it always tells. And this family lineage of mathematics, I think, is still present. There is still a certain tension between arithmetic and geometry, even to this to the present day, because it's so deeply embedded in the fabric of number itself, that all the attempts that we've made to unify the concept of number, um, certainly for the Greeks would have been outrageous against a, a difference that they felt probably was even a beautiful difference, and a difference that was being respected not between arithmetic and geometry, I mean, for very deep and important reasons. So I, I mean, it seems to me that that family lineage is always is haunts us even today, and so I just want to put it forward as something to talk about when we speak about mathematics. I think the intent being math mathematics now also, but mm -hmm. it seems to me maybe it will be helpful, yeah. even if this is all merely in the past, which I don't believe. Well, I think what you're saying is really interesting. I've never, never really heard them, but uh, Euclid's elements of like he. It's called the elements of geometry. Yes. But uh, book six to book nine is straight prime numbers. In what sense is that geometry? But it's uh, all expressed geometrically. It's expressed geometrically. As opposed to, say, Diophantus, who, who doesn't, really used yeah. letters to stand for. Yeah. And wasn't it just called Stokia uh, elements? elements? I'm not sure that, that it was of geometry. It was, there there is much call geometry. It, in, but I think that it was meant to be both, yeah. the elements of both. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that the word of geometry, as if, as if the word geometry were hanging over the whole, I'm not sure that that goes back to the ancient text, in mm -hmm. which yeah. this is the elements of the two sisters together, right, right, in right. separate books, and, yeah. for a very good reason, and kept separate yeah. to avoid yeah. the problem yeah. of the incommensurable, the problem of irrational numbers, which I don't know whether that's beautiful or not. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether the response, and this is another, is the response to beauty awesome? Is it simply a sense, a kind of an aesthetic glow, or is it a kind of shock? What about the joy of, of uh, the, uh, the Ananda that uh, yes. Michael uh, refers to as the Indian? Well, I only have a few sentences, ah. and I, they are under the chair, but I think they won't, they won't, uh, they won't, they won't add anything to the discussion. It's just, okay. uh, it, there's, it's, it's clear just from the preparation that I wasn't supposed to do, that there's a, a vast, a vast uh, domain of inquiry that a comparative, uh, comparative study of mathematical aesthetics that, uh, nobody, that nobody has undertaken. This goes back to this. Earlier? Well, yeah. you know, I wanted to fo follow up the idea earlier that, uh, that the concept of beauty uh, you know, in the post-Ruskin phase mm -hmm. was removed from a central position uh, in aesthetic thinking, and I, and I think that uh, the sense at that time was that there was a platonic pre presupposition about the nature of categories, about essentialism, and that, in fact, a given subject, oh, and that a given subject could be defined uh, by the essence that every member of a class mm -hmm. shares. Mm -hmm. And so that form of Platonism was really kind of resident inside aesthetic thinking until the post-Ruskin phase, when beauty got removed. And the reason it got removed is that uh, there was a new awareness that there's no single criterion for the adjudication of a work of art that carries mm -hmm. across all cases. And, of course, if there were an essence, then there would be such a criterion. There isn't, and so, in fact, in fact, uh, Wittgenstein opens his lectures on aesthetics with the idea that, you know, people think in aesthetics that the word beauty is central, or that the word mm -hmm. beautiful is central. Mm -hmm. It isn't. Look at our actual aesthetic vocabulary, which is vast and extensive. Pay attention to that, and you'll learn much more about the concept in play than you will by trying to arrive at a platonic essence. So, so I think that's part of what part of what sort of moved beauty out of the central place. But then, then that to connect that to mathematics, that then gives us the question: 
what is the vocabulary apart from beautiful or apart from the ugly? Right? Uh, could, could there be a uh, form of mathematics that's inept or that's clumsy or that's uh, you know objectionable in various ways as subcategories of the ugly? I, I don't. I ask you. I don't. I don't know. But I think that that's why beauty got removed. And you're right. There's a resurgence. Beauty is back <laughs> in uh, in aesthetic uh, thinking, well, but in a non-essentialistic way. Maybe here music is of help because. Um, the concept of dissonance. I mean, one thinks about the, the new kinds of beauty in the ever more modern forms of art as embracing greater, more and more dissonant states and allowing them, um, not merely allowing them, but embracing them as having forms of the beautiful that previously were not allowed when those kinds of dissonances were, were forbidden by certain rules. And it seems to me also in, in mathematics, it seems to me the the, 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 the proof of the, that there's irrational numbers is a, a kind of dissonant proof in which there's a shown to be a dissonance between the possibility of there being ratios and the, 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 the attempt to find such a ratio that would describe the diagonal of a, sw a square. The fact that it can't be done or that many mathematical proofs are reductios or assertions that something cannot be or that it's even better yet, that its non-existence cannot be, which defines a kind of existence in mathematics. Each of them operates through a kind of dissonance or surprise, which may be a kind of joy, I mean, that, to go back to that term, but it often involves assimilating a contradiction or a certain newness or something that has the shock of the new, but which at a certain point is not rejected, but embraced in some way. And I, I, have, I think that some of our ideas about beauty on the one hand and mathematics on the other are sort of static. And it's interesting to go back to the idea of sensu mm -hmm. sensuality of mathematics. If you can apply the word joy, which has a little bit more of an explosive dynamic quality to it, maybe it, it says something about what really may be going on in mathematics. It's not a static thing. It does evolve and grow. And similarly, beauty and our notions of beauty continue to grow. And, and that links nicely to a, uh, what is a fundamental question. That is, uh, is you know, mathematics the kind of thing that is discovered? We speak of Russell discovering Russell's paradox. And when was that, 1900 or something like that? Uh, and uh, you know, the set of all sets not members of themselves. If they are, they aren't. If they aren't, they are. Uh, and so you kind of bump your head against the, the wall, if you will, of a, of a paradox. Is that a source of beauty, or is that a source of, the, does it work against beauty? That, that is, you know, is, is the pure thing that's full and complete the more beautiful thing, or is the imperfection in it that is, after all, a kind of, manifest, a kind of mimetic depiction of humanity, is that the more beautiful thing? You know? uh, so how, how does paradox work as a determinant or a distraction to beauty? Would you think of the Russell conundrum as kind of an agony? Rather than, I mean, it's, it's in a different dimension than beauty. It's more mental. Yeah. I mean, after all, the, the 16th century uh, uh, Italian um, algebraists who wanted to make use of this, the square root of minus one mm -hmm. uh, said, dismissing mental tortures because it was agony, mm -hmm. do it because it's going to solve your problem. Yeah. So it, could, it be, could it be in that direction, that it's a question of yeah. joy from Michael Harris's Ananda uh, to uh, discomfort from the yeah. point of view of Russell, but that's, that's a different dimension. Yeah, yeah. But yet, that, yet there's Godel's proof, which is pretty much dealing with the same sort of topic, right? And isn't, do people not think that's beautiful, or because of the, the way it condenses a... You would have beautiful. to learn, yeah. you would have to, you could imagine no. a person that was agonized, and at a certain point might realize that their agony was actually a kind of superlative pleasure. Right. I, was, I mean, the yeah, joy is yeah, not, yeah, simply, yeah, right. not simply, not simply the you know, <laughs> It can also be the sense, when you, when you watch a child um, tasting a new food for the first time, usually the first expression is, and then the expression may change to like, at first it's like, well, this is a new thing. I haven't tasted this before. And then suddenly it's like, oh, it's, it's you or it's that. And so it seems to me there's some kind of transformation so that the irrational could be some kind of horror, some kind of dark mystery that you would kill people over. And at another point, it might be something that would be embraced as being the most wonderful thing. 
Yes, it's really both, or oh, it has been both. both. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? Both, yeah. It's, okay. it's, it's like the Kantian mathematical, uh, it's called, he calls it the mathematical sublime, yes. yeah. which is a kind of a little three-act uh, mini-drama where you're confronted with something just larger than your intellect, the infinite, no. so no. to speak. And uh, uh, that's act one. Act two is... Um, uh, you're, you're in agony. Yeah. Act three is, you come out of it saying, my God, my finite intellect can conceive <laughs> of the agony of thinking about of this, this larger thing. Exactly, and you kind of exemplify... That's what, uh, that's what he, he refers to, the mathematical sublime. Yeah? Exactly, where you kind of exemplify a contradiction in yourself. That is, you, account, you, you take into your mind something larger than your mind can accommodate, and you realize you are accommodating that thing that reaches beyond you. So it, it's, it's a kind of step into a kind of transcendence there. And, and, and for him, for Kant, of course, in the third critique, he separated the sublime from the beautiful. I, my question was always, should that separation be as rigorous as, as he suggested? Because it seems to me that these kinds of experiences of the sublime, uh, which, which you get, in fact, when you're a little kid, you know, and you learn numbers, you try to come up with your sibling or something, the highest number, you know, and you finally think a million, million, and then your, your smarter sibling says a million, million plus one, and then you think, oh, damn it, you know. Uh, well, that moment, right, is the moment where you actually realize the, there's, you know, you grasp the concept of infinity. And, and, and at, that, at that moment, you do kind of step over a platonic line from the world of the sensory world to this higher, higher world of relations. And that, that's a sublime experience. It seems to me that it's, we could call that a beautiful form of beauty, I, I think. Yeah. I, I'm bothered by this feeling like maybe we belong to some kind of high church mm. you know, or some kind of yeah, tradition. Yeah. Where these things we find sublime, we find uplifting, we find joyous. I'm thinking, while, while you were speaking, I was thinking of my students, my undergraduate students, for whom almost everything is an agony. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so to, I guess it, it has to do with this sub- subjective objective divide. And I feel probably one of the things I believe most strongly is that mathematics is objective and that these feelings are objectively based, but I keep coming back to these fears that I'm just (laughs) fooling myself. Mm. Like, you know, the guy at the end of 1984 who believes that 2 plus 2 equals Mm 5. And he's he's now happy (laughs) with that result. You know, so so, so I I guess it's, how do we do the reality testing here? To, to, but, to, uh, 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 is mathematics the same experience for you, as a mathematician, and for your students? I mean, can you even talk about mathematics as being unified when so many different groups of people experience it in different ways? Yeah, or you know, the engineer mm-hmm. experiences yeah. it in a third way. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it's not unified. (laughs) Or or the the sense of unity as a kind of struggle. I mean, we take unified as if it were a given thing. But it seems to me that the, from what I can know of the mathematical experience, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to unify things that seem to be, well, dissonant, Mm -hmm. moving in different directions. There are tensions between them, in this musical sense, and the attempt to grasp and put them together to form a unity, but the unity is always being searched for. It's not a, a given thing from which mm-hmm. things are simply unfolding. It's experienced mm-hmm. in some kind of dynamic yeah. way. Actually, you know, the, the uh, 18th century uh, Scottish philosopher Francis Hutcheson uh, wrote a, a book in aesthetics, and uh, he, he uh, finally arrived, after much struggle, he arrived at the idea of uniformity amidst variety. Uh, and he said that what is engaging and what's successful in a work of art is where you, you hit this kind of point of equipoise between too much variety so you can't make sense of it, or too much, uh, too much unity so it becomes boring and kind of lifeless in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and I, does that capture part of what is beautiful about mathematics, if there is, if, there is, if that's not just an analogy? Uh, does that capture, uh, you know, ca- mathematics can be too... There, there is a live tension between those two ways of viewing mathematics. And it's really live in the sense that there are people, uh, people I know, even friends, who are uh, making an effort to uh, hand over mathematics to machines because they don't trust human beings with mm. a mathematics. 
and they believe that the validation, the only uh, reliable validation, can come from machine. This goes back uh, to Russell and, and, and Frege, the idea. Mm -hmm. the idea. Russell, who specifically referred to mathematics as a cold beauty, which is quite the opposite mm -hmm. of sensual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that is, uh, for, for, for others, for me in particular, this would represent the death of, of, of mathematics. Now, since we're in the, the New York Tech well, Analytic so Institute, then I have to say that the, the death wish is a, is a, is a, <laughs> is a, is a, is a constant feature of, of, of the mathematical practice, because at, at a certain point, you just want the thing to be proved. You don't want to, you don't, you don't, and you don't in some sense, care whether it's you or, or a machine who did it. So, so what do you think about the two camps? Oh, well, I'm very clearly in the, in the other camp, but yeah. I, at the same time, I understand most of the people who are actively promoting this have had a, 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 a crisis of one kind or another. That is to say, mm. they found that there was a mistake in a proof many years after mm. they published it, or very shortly before it was set to be published. Or in the case of, of Tom Hales, for example, it was unable to find anybody who proved Tom Hales, very famous for proving the Kepler conjecture on, on the, the, the packing of spheres in three-dimensional space. But, there was no, but he had to uh, use a computer to verify it, and the code was so complicated that no human being was able to, 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 to vouch for it. And so deciding to, he decided to uh, develop a, a system, an a, a automated system that would, by reformulating it in a new language that only machines could read, could, 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 uh, could verify it. And but, it. but in a way that continues the same theme of reaching beyond. I thought that you exactly, put exactly. That, that, that the proof wants to reach beyond human capabilities and it then has to start to, um, as, as you've written about, it has to imagine the part that androids might play or android <laughs> mathematicians and computers that would carry out the steps. And then the relationship between those androids and the human beings that would, would or would not decide that they were going to accept what the androids told them about the proof, proof being okay. But uh, it seemed to me that, that, that Barry, that one of the things that you've introduced in your writings that has helped me a lot to understand this is the, uh, the idea that to be a mathematician is to have a dream, uh, you know, that at a certain level, that, the, that uh, a mathematician past a certain point is distinguished by their, his or her dream. And a dream seems to me a very interesting place to talk about the relationship of beauty and unity because it represents something which is consciously reaching beyond and yet has a very definite form and is struggling to encompass something which is the, the shape of that mathematician's mm -hmm. dream, which may be different from mathematician to mathematician, and may or may not involve android participation in their dream. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell about your essay about dreams in mathematics? It's too, it's too good. You mean, oh, and right, about the androids. The, no, about the circles. Disturbed. Oh yes, right, yes, yeah. right. No, there was a, uh, there's a story. I mean, this is. I'll yeah. tell the end. It's a there's, story. There's a, this is in a book about mathematics and narratives. So I, I, I recounted a story. There was a mathematician named uh, Robert Thomason published a, a paper, uh, and at the beginning, and he published it jointly with somebody who was not only not a mathematician, but who was deceased, and in fact had committed suicide. And his, the, particip the, the contribution, it, years, some time before the, the, this work had been done, and uh, he'd been thinking about this question for a long time. And once he, one day he woke up with a start, he said, because his friend uh, had told him in a dream, if you want to solve the problem, you do, you do this. And when he woke up, he said, well, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. I, mean, I know that's wrong. I know why it's wrong. And he said his friend was so insistent that, we did, he, <coughs> during the dream, not afterwards, that, uh, that he thought about it, and he realized that this was the objection he had to this, this, uh, this, this, this answer his friend gave was the only obstacle, and once he, over, once he accounted for that, then he actually could finish the, uh, the proof. And he, and he, the editors this, of this, of this uh, <laughs> volume agreed to include his, his, uh, 
deceased friend as a co-author. It's the only, I think the only case in history. <laughs> <laughs> but being wrong but was a, another form of being right. Exactly. If someone says no, no, mm -hmm. that absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's that wonderful essay of Freud in which he says, if the patient says, it's not your mother, you know it's his mother. Mm -hmm. There's no no at a certain level. So, mm -hmm. Or the, if something is really, really wrong, it's touching the truth or in some way, or it's touching something that you absolutely have to look at, if only to find out what the wrongness, quote-unquote, is all about. I want to say at least one word for unity. I know that, I know that we're now in the completely disunified situation here. Exactly. Um, uh, and that is that what's shocking in when you work in mathematics is that there are analogies that unify different subjects. Mm -hmm. I mean, the most basic one is um, algebraic geometry or analytic geometry. That is to say, the algebra and geometry have two totally different intuitions. You, you're in one mindset when you're doing algebraic equations. You're in a totally different mindset when you're trying to think of... Um, whether um, this triangle is isosceles or not. Um, and yet, they can be joined by analogy. They can be unified. Uh, the intuitions themselves can be unified. And what happens is you have a, a synthesis. You have some other thing which you can't call algebra. You can't call geometry. Mm -hmm. So you use these uh, combined... Um, uh, phrases, algebraic geometry. Uh, now that's a new intuition which binds together two subjects and we, we, we're in the midst of an, a lace of different analogies in uh, not only in pure mathematics but in, uh, also with the, uh, in applied situations even more in a way and um, isn't that a unification? I, I have a story about that, too. Good. Uh, because arith arithmetic and geometry uh, for the ancient Greeks were separate because they had separate, uh, they had separate domains. Mm -hmm. They applied in separate domains, and the, and the sciences mm -hmm. were defined by the domains, uh, so they could not be the same. And then uh, when algebra was discovered by al khwarizmi the very first page... He, he talked about how happy he was because he'd found something that could solve problems in arithmetic and geometry. And, mm -hmm. and, and, um, but then there was, uh, there was the quadrivium. Um, then the, the uh, Al-Farabi, a little bit later, uh, decided to come up with a catalog of the sciences. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, five different kinds of sciences. One was mathematics, but he couldn't figure out where to put algebra, because algebra was, mm -hmm. what they, this was an, supposed, he was an Aristotelian, but he couldn't, he couldn't disagree, but on the other hand, algebra was there. So he put it in with the science of tricks. So he called it, he had a, 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 a section in the, in the chapter on, on, on mathematics for tricks that included uh, mechanical mm -hmm. devices mm -hmm. and algebra mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and engineering, <laughs> things like that. And in fact, algebra started out as kind of a rough and tumble art of challenges, public challenges mm. between the virtuosi that would challenge each other to solve a certain problem and, and humiliate the other person or steal their answer if you possibly could have been uh, with apologies to them. So it, in that sense, it begins. So, yes, I disagreed on the beauty, but <laughs> okay. with you on unity. And maybe one way of viewing it is that there's a latent analogies among all the parts of the We haven't discovered all of them yet. But they, they, they can all should be fungible into each other somehow. Because, they, because, in fact, they do share a domain. Which so is? They, the domain of mathematics. I mean, right, right. I mean the Greeks, the Greeks were, were kind of limited, you know, in, in, their vi in that vision. And, and, but I, I mean, it's, it, 
I struggle to define, you know, what the domain of mathematics is. But I told my class yesterday that mathematics is the only subject we teach in the university where we know what's right and we know what's wrong, <laughs> and that, and and that through history it hasn't changed. Now I was lying, I think, a little bit to them, but 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 it's the feeling behind that statement that I think underlies my sense of unity of mathematics. And it just one more thing: it has something to do with the fact that we are, con even though I believe it's objective, we're constructing our vision of this objective realm. You know, that's I mean Heidegger stressed this that the mathematical is what's knowable to human beings because we're constructing it mm -hmm. uh, in, in a way that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, aligns with our own understanding of things. And, that, and it's that, <coughs> that domain, I think, that, that is unified. Could I, could I add to that, though, that unification costs something. If you're going to take two <laughs> subjects that have a tension between them, I don't think we can act as if unifying them is just something that you can do, and it's all wonderful. It may be wonderful, but I think your students are will know that there's a price and that you have to stand in a different place. The unity, the part of the beauty of it, I suppose, in the, is, is, is that you have to, to think about algebra. As every school child knows, you, know, there's, there, you have to put yourself in a different mind or you, you can't approach it in the same way. And there's a kind of mental price that's exacted. I think that I think that one of the things that bothers people when they're struggling with mathematics is that they feel that there's a price that has to be paid. They don't know how much it is or what it is exactly, but they feel their struggle to understand. That's real. I never thought of it that way. That's really interesting. And I think people wouldn't mind paying if they were told how much. The trouble is that the professor says, oh, no, 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 it's all perfectly clear. You should understand this. It's all unified. They know that that's something about that bothers them. They know that the, the, the mathematician is right, but what the mathematician has forgotten is how much he or she paid in a certain mm -hmm. way for it, mm -hmm. at a certain point in their life, which maybe is even forgotten to them, but which now the student is being asked, now you must pay, in intuition, in changing your mind, in, I mean, if, if the mathematica are the learnable things, I, which I don't think this is what Heidegger is saying, but I think it's the things that you can learn. But learning in each case means having to pay mm. something, having to, to, to leave some of your blood behind in order to gain something. Because the more precious the thing is, the more you would have to sacrifice and to give, and not just of money, but of something very, very dear to yourself. And people struggle with that. Mm. Well, Descartes sort of was trying to... Uh, protect himself, I think, mm -hmm. from that by saying, he said, uh, uh, that his analytic geometry corrected the defects of both subjects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of algebra and geometry. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. felt that it was, it was an issue, that it was, there was going to be a change of viewpoint, but he also felt that the, his union of algebra and geometry was a way of correcting things. Sure, mm -hmm. and after you pay the money... You pay. Right, yeah. but he begins by saying of common sense is the least common thing in the world, his joke, at everybody's expense. And common sense is going to be what, what happens after you take his point of view and you see, of course, he's right. This is much better. It's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. But something had to be paid. And it, it, it seems to me that there's a kind of justice in that. If you want to know more, you really do have to leave some blood behind. And it's true not just for the mathematician that's breaking into new ground, but it's true of the child that for whom geometry makes a certain kind of sense, and then they're confronted with these symbols, mm -hmm. and if someone acts as if, well, of course, you should understand this right away, and this is all kind of obvious. And the textbooks treat it as if it would be shameful not to understand it almost immediately, but mm -hmm. the child within themselves, or many adults, do feel like, no, it's not clear to me, no, it doesn't make sense. I, I feel as if I have to view this in a different way, but I'm not being allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. And no place is given for the transition in which I would, the, the journey that I would have to take at the end of which I would agree with Descartes, say, now I see what you mean. Yes, it is mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. But the discussion would have to be, 
what happened en route? Mm -hmm. What were the what were the series mm -hmm. of steps, even emotional ones? I've never had mm -hmm. such emotional classes as those in mathematics, it seemed to me, in which passions boiled over and mm -hmm. feelings, which were not given a, any kind of vent in the texts of mathematics boiled over in the students mm -hmm. that were struggling to to understand things and and understanding that somehow their frustrations were not, in certain way, the, the uh, ostensible topic of the mathematics class that they were having, but which they were feeling nonetheless. Mm -hmm. hmm. You oh. know, it, no, uh, there's a, uh, it's extremely interesting, and it maps onto my own experience in lots of ways. Uh, another source of possible unity of the field um, it could be by following out a kind of um, ontological question about what kind of thing is it. And in our in our talk here, a number of us have used um, the word discovery. I did in connection with Russell's paradox a moment ago. Uh, but Barry used the term intuition a moment ago. Hmm. And, uh, and <coughs> finding algebra, right? And so in the logic of the concept discovery is, of course, the implication that the thing you discover exists prior to your getting there to see it. Right? And uh, so if we use that word, then that platonic implication is in play. If we use the word intuition, then I think, wasn't there a Breuer? Does that sound right? Is there, is there a mathematician or a philosopher oh. mathematician named Breuer? Brower. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who, you know, uh, who had a different view entirely, if I understand this. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and on that view, uh, it's not that we're discovering in mathematics, we human beings are discovering something in mathematics that exists out there in this platonic world prior to our arrival at it, but rather we're sort of like painting a painting. And it was Picasso who said every single brushstroke in a painting changes the entire picture. And of, of course, in a way that's false, but in a deeper sense it's true because what happens is that with a single brushstroke the logic, if you will, of everything else going on now has to accommodate itself to that. And so if I understand it, there's this kind of anti-platonic view of mathematics that suggests that we don't discover it, that, that that's the wrong model, we don't, we don't find it. Uh, there's something more creative at work, but I, I would be the last person to be able to answer that, but I think... Well, Avner, you came close to describing it, but I think you, you would fall short of Intuitionism as your favorite uh, approach. Well, you describe. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. One, one of my problems is I, I see both sides of every picture yeah. all the time. And <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> so, in, in, I think in my heart of hearts, I think mathematics is an objective domain that we are discovering. But in in, in the way we deal with it uh, on a daily basis, I think I, I have a lot of sympathy with the intuitionists mm. and that we are constructing somehow, maybe it's like a miracle, we're constructing a body of knowledge or doctrine that corresponds to, the, uh, to this objective mm. uh, world. Well, I want to go back to this comment about uh, paying, mm. paying for this. And you didn't say, though I think you made it very clear, you pay in advance. <laughs> yeah. You're paying in advance yes. yeah. for the outcome. Yeah. And my question is, so then what is the payoff? And is that beauty or is that joy? Or yeah. In the particular instance of Peter's, uh, it's a new synthesis, a synthetic new intuition which somehow conjoins the algebraic intuition and the geometric. So but could you the, describe that as being a, a, a form of joy or, or an instance of joy or beauty? Is yeah, I question. think there's a certain shock that's associated with it. Um, and there's, or even, not even unified, I mean, I'm just thinking about the child that's, that's, that feels okay with geometry and is struggling with the idea of algebra. I mean, you're paying kind of continuously. There, and, and yet there's, it seems to be often that there's a moment where you start to see like, oh, I see, if you stand and look at it this way, mm. the idea that you would have to take a different point of view already is a tremendous change for people because they have a certain, based on what they think of their intuitions. Yeah. My intuitions say this, and you're telling me that my intuition, that these are my intuitions that we're speaking about. And yet you very rightly say like, but... But look, if you, if you stand over here, and you say, over where? Okay, well, where, how exactly do I get there? Well, and then you help me, and I, I struggle with it, and finally, maybe I get a little bit, and I start to see, like, oh, I could start to see this starts to make sense. It did, wouldn't have made sense. I was right. It wouldn't have made sense to my intuitions, to the way I was. But if I'm able to shift myself into a different place, it seems to me that's a large part of the beauty. I mean, I've... Mm -hmm. 
if I don't know, I would like to ask the real the, the, the mathematicians here. I mean, that sense of shifting and struggling and trying to find the new place to which which you're doing constantly. I mean, and as much as the child is doing, and without yet knowing where it is that you have to stand or how much it's going to cost you, but somehow. At your point, your you, you have had experience such that it's going to be worth the struggle and the agony and the desire to have it all be over with when you reach that new point and can see things in a, in a, in a new way. As happens in the perception of art all the time, changing, changing your stance metaphorically so that you yeah. see the object in question in a different set of relations. But there's no question in my mind that the payoff for the mathematician, this is a very... A, a very uh, <coughs> special population, maybe, maybe it could even be called a. It's 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 not in the direct. What's this? The uh, the. Uh, it's it's not recognized. It's not a recognized. You mean uh, the, a in the DSM four? Yes, yes, it's not. Yes, it's not recognized as a, <laughs> as, a as a pathology. <laughs> but it, it, it could well be. Uh, the payoff for mathematicians uh, is precisely these very rare moments which I wouldn't hesitate to call joyous when suddenly everything makes sense in a way that they hadn't before. Mm -hmm. And, it's, mm -hmm. and I, th there are many, many, uh, many, many mathematicians speak of this, if you read what they say. They, yeah. they talk about what, what their motivation is. And in fact, there was a sociological study of mathematics comparing... Quoted in your book, right? right comparing <laughs> pure and applied math <laughs> mathematicians. And applied mathematicians, they're, they're most... They're most primary motivation is to do something useful. And pure, mo uh, pure mathematicians' primary motivation is pleasure. And they say that. <laughs> it's just, uh, that's, uh, so, so. Pleasure achieved through pain. So, so they're hedonists and masochists simultaneously. Well, they don't, they, they <laughs> somehow mean, don't, you know, the, the pain is easily forgotten. Right, in the same way that, the, I mean, an athlete will, you know, for whom, you know, a kind of trying to do even one, t you know, a tiny amount of what they do for me might be an agony. For them is their daily, their joy and the source of a kind of sustenance so that you, but that's only achieved after a while. The student sees it from the other end, they see it as pure agony. They don't, they don't understand. And I thought the part of our discussion was to try to understand how it was that the, that the struggle to understand, the, what's that verse in the, man stretch out thy mind so that thou mightst understand these things, which seem to imply from the point of view of the speaker of the scriptures that, that the the effort of stretching out your understanding was, was something that was suitable for human beings, but also difficult for them, and uh, something that was a kind of divine, a divine call. In, in psychoanalysis, there is a moment where uh, the analyst says something, and uh, what we call the patient has an aha moment. Mm -hmm. And that aha moment has a quality of uh, pleasure, joy, uh, both for the patient, even that aha may not be particularly, uh, mm. may have painful qualities to it. But there is something about that moment of understanding on the both sides that makes it joyous and special. And maybe you could say beautiful. <coughs> Somebody hearing that kind of interpretation may say, well, that was a beautiful interpretation. I thought part of the issue with mathematics is that you discover something that is already there. And as you keep discovering, it seems to fit into place and fit into place and fit into place. So from the moment you had the Big Bang, from the moment of the Big Bang, mathematics, I think, if I understand it correctly, came about. And that you keep discovering, and there's something about this that has a specialness, has a cohesion, has a kind of beauty, because it falls so nicely into place, that uh, is what makes it particularly special and unified, or in unity. That's what I, the way I understood it. Mm. In practice, these, these moments, aha moments, eureka moments, are, uh, those are the occasions for people to use, 
the word beautiful, and I think it may be almost, set, almost involuntary, like a, just an exclamation or ejaculation. This is a, uh, this is, for lack of a better vocabulary, uh, people, in fact, I even, I, I try to avoid it, but once, uh, last spring, I couldn't help myself, I wanted to say something to a person who'd given a particularly inspiring lecture, and I used that word, and I felt terrible about it. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't, couldn't, because it doesn't say anything, it just is an expression of approval and, and, well, and joy. Joy. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah. Well, what's wrong with that as an expression yeah. of joy? I mean, isn't that, um, it's conventional. It's too conventional. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. <laughs> what's math if it's not conventional? <laughs> right. But maybe all moments where the mind changes, maybe that's the essence of beauty, is that it's not merely the apprehension of kind of something, a static kind of proportion that is in some given way pleasing. It seems as if the moments that we're describing are moments when there's been a deep change in the mind. Perhaps the analyst has, maybe the patient themselves, the analyst has said that same insight maybe more than once before. Maybe that it was the moment when the patient could understand. Where it, where's, is their insight, not merely the psychoanalyst? Because if it was just the psychoanalyst, the person could say yes, yes, or no. It wouldn't matter what they said. It wasn't yet their insight. And therefore, it was merely empty because there had been no change of mind. The moments that are both agonizing or beautiful was the moment when a person changes their mind. And when you think about it, that's a very, it's a difficult or perhaps even impossible thing. How am I to think differently than I think and to feel differently than I feel? By definition, it's impossible. Can one go around the room and ask, <laughs> are there moments that, that we, that you, recognize as a deep change of mind which produced joy or produced uh, Not some me, emotion. No. <laughs> uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there's a spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yes, I can remember a few real important moments where it's like um, almost like the duck rabbit where you're, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you know, your perspective shifts and suddenly yeah. you see something a different way and then that enables you to go, go forward. And those are, those are very exciting. What about the idea of this turning point also involving sort of a condensation of sort that you, you've simplified something that was unwieldy and chaotic? Mm -hmm. Isn't that a part of this feeling that we're touching on? Yeah, and that's also very important historically. The, way, the, way, the only way mathematics can, can progress is this process of sedimentation mm. where, where ideas somehow get summarized into probably a theorem and then into a definition and then into a word and then, you know, and then that gets laid down yeah. and then you can go on. Isn't that part of the opposition to mm -hmm. people who don't like computers doing math? Mm -hmm. That you don't get to observe that. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But one of the aha moments that it's a collective aha moments is a total change of vocabulary where one realizes as a community that, just, just at random, I'm telling you, that symmetries are important. You know, that the idea of thinking of the group of symmetries of something rather than focusing specifically on the thing gives you an, an inroad, an insight. Mm -hmm. Now that is certainly a change of viewpoint, but it's not any one person's. I mean, if one goes in the history, I mean, it's sort of, it developed. But it's a, it is a kind of low... Uh, slow-moving aha mm -hmm. moment of the community, which, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not reluctant to call it a sort of communal yeah. joy yeah. Mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as having a result of that, uh, mm -hmm. having it as a... The, That's a sort of narrative that, would ca that captures, and I know you know this, captures people's attention, readers' attentions, if they're rendered in a, in a chapter, like describing, even if it was very slow to develop. It's, mm -hmm. it's captivating to read about those mm -hmm. sorts of developments. Mm -hmm. My answer to uh, Barry's question uh, seems far, far afield, but it, it actually isn't. Um, I'll be very brief about the far afield part. Um, it, it happened in my life when I was a very young person, probably 14 years of age, and I discovered the bossa nova on the guitar. Uh, and, uh, and that was a revelation for me. I'm still trying to recover. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, before that, I just played block 
chords. Um, there's a C chord, a G chord, F chord, and so on. And these are block harmonic uh, sort of entities that you that you move in a in a blunt way from from one to the other. I learned the bossa nova on the fingerboard, and suddenly all of these things that I thought were independent were interrelated through voice leading, uh, finger by finger by finger, so that you never moved in a block way at all. It was always a subtle movement where you saw internal relations from one part to the next to the next to the next. All of that music written on the guitar uh, functioned, functioned in that way. And so I saw harmony in a completely different way. That's the far afield part. The closer in part is, well, that phenomenon of seeing relations between things in a much, much more complicated way than you initially envisaged. And, and it's, it, the simple way has been in your practice. You see this other way of seeing everything. You still have C chords and G chords and F chords, but the interrelations between them are so complex, these spider webs of relations that you're working out on the fingerboard take you into a form of understanding you never would have had, so that you end up really saying, you know, there really isn't anything such as a C chord or an F chord. It's all a matter of the relations into which things enter, and that's what makes them what they are. Um, and I'm, as I say, uh, that, that was a moment where I saw the world, saw the musical world completely differently. And, and certainly analogies all over, you know, aesthetics and the arts, and I imagine there might be analogies in mathematics. I, I, yeah, that being able to yoke together two things at once. I'm thinking about something that I learned from Barry, who had an insight about the numbers, the natural numbers, as being related to, for instance, knots. Not so now. I mean, well, that's an analogy. Yeah, and exactly. And to me, that was a moment of there was. That's why I asked about the shock because it was like I was shocked, and then the next moment I said, "Well, it somehow seemed familiar, or it seemed right." But I think part of it also has to do with two things coming together. That there's a certain kind of tension. It's a little bit like um, two voices in music, or not two notes being heard at once. And that the unity is being grasped again through a kind of certain kind of tension between them. Um, uh, yeah. I guess also in studying mathematics, realizing that one was allowed to feel, I remember struggling with it, and that one was allowed to feel the sense of dissonance, that one was allowed, maybe privately, if not publicly, to struggle with things, and that that was. That even when you approach a dissonance in music, a consonance in music, and you're tuning two strings, as you approach very close, they become more and more dissonant. And it, mm -hmm. you know, if you've been tuning it, they kind of jangle, and then suddenly they fall into a kind of order. Um, I mean, my private theory about this is that it, this is probably completely illegitimate biologically is that we're descended from amphibians that those are our distant ancestors, and that the, the beings that live both on the land and the water, <laughs> and that, that probably were laughed at by the other creatures that were not amphibians and thought that it was absurd that we would go from being in the womb and not breathing and then breathing. This is just silly. But somehow our ancestors were able to survive when the land dried up and we, they lay there gasping, but somehow... It, that there's something about the amphibian in us that is still remains, so that when two things come together, when there's an analogy, it has that same force of we are beings that have to live both in the land and in the water and have to go back and forth between them at home on neither or in both. And so that there's something strangely familiar to us about the situation of two, the two parts of an analogy coming together. Okay, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, if you're going to make a comment, make it very short and then ask a question. Kristen. Um, one word that keeps coming to my mind today is abstraction. I'm not sure if it's been mm. mentioned yet. No. The ma mathematics is always dealing with layers of abstraction. Maybe you start with something in the real world, like five bottles on a table, and then you... Geometry can tell you something about them, and topology can tell you something, and algebra can tell you something, and then you abstract those one layer, or many, many layers farther, and you end up in unity. Um, and I was thinking about this problem with students in that it's really a lack of understanding or appreciation of this process of abstraction as beautiful in itself. And um, I just, I guess I was wondering if you have thoughts about that. I, I thought in particular the, the comment about dissonance as a, and 
as something that is kind of a commentary on what we already know, and then we move past that dissonance, and that kind of opens up a new world that, in a way, like mm. comparing it to the rationals mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. Gödel's theory and stuff. Um, Gosh, I thought I had a question in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's a good no, it's very good. It's very good. I think it's a good question. What was the question? About, about abstraction. What is the about abstraction. abstraction. What? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the thing is, if you're doing mathematics, abstract is a verb rather than a noun, because you're seeing something and you, hmm. you abstract it, that is, say, you produce uh, a structure that's inherent in it, but the minute you do it, that mm. verb is no longer uh, useful. It's not an abstraction to you. It's as, as concrete mm. as even anything else that you're working with. It becomes as concrete as um, lines and, and triangles, no matter how abstract it is. But I, I think that fits in with what Peter was saying about the price you pay. Mm. So there's this price to abstract. There is a certain energy. You have to put in this energy to gain the abstraction and then be able to live with it. And, and I'm going to go back to my classes with your thoughts in mind there, trying to, it'll last about a day or two, <laughs> try and help them over this. this um, so it's almost like an energy hump mm. to get to yeah. the next level of abstraction. I, I was, can you come to the... I, I can shout. All right, I can have it. So th this is a lovely discussion. I wonder how different it would have been if this discussion happened 100 years ago when this society was formed, or in fact 1,000 years ago. Hmm. And I think many of us would agree that it wouldn't be fundamentally different. Yet, I think there are, there are certain things that we can offer these days. So beauty is, of course, in the eye of the beholder, but this is the wrong phrase. Mm -hmm. It's in the brain of the beholder. So we would like to know where in the brain and how in the brain beauty is represented. Mm. So a good friend of mine, Samuel Zaki, asked the same question in University College London and has an answer. So what, you can, what he has done is that he shows beautiful women, beautiful men, to people and a particular structure called the nucleus accumbens, which is the site where dopamine is being released, lights up. Then it shows to a, a lot of people, professional musicians and people like me, uh, uh, Schomberg, uh, uh, let's say Bartok, and Ligeti, <laughs> and surprisingly, in the professional musician, the same structure lights up. Mm -hmm. Then he recruited a bunch of mathematicians, and they showed mathematicians beautiful equations and beautiful problems and also to people like me. And the surprise was, of course, that the cloud subpendence in the fMRI lights up. So if you are looking at from the point of view of the observer, which is this, in this case is the brain, you have an answer that what beauty is. What beauty is, is that what Peter said, this is this energy barrier, which is once it is solved, or once you overcome it, it releases dopamine, mm. and that's where beauty is. Hmm. I have, neuroscience, of course, has answers also in aesthetics. <laughs> 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 has answers about the unity of math, if you are interested. I can, mm. I can talk about that. Mm. That's a wonderful uh, description of interesting research. But it also does, I think, misses the point about what's, what beauty is. This is the outcome. This, this says that when people do find something beautiful, that part of their brain lights up. That's not saying, well, what is it that makes it beautiful, right? Because mm. I guess you can infer from that study that di different people with different perspectives or different funds of knowledge might find something beautiful that someone else might not find beautiful, right? Yeah. But you shouldn't equate, and not that you were saying this, but shouldn't equate the nucleus accumbens as the, you know, the, the core of beauty like the pineal gland was where the soul entered the, the body. This is a wonderful question. I, I, I agree with the first part. I think that the, um, to say it's in the eye of the beholder, uh, I agree with you, is entirely wrong. But you said it, it's in the brain of the beholder. Uh, I want to say non-reductively, um, anti-physiologically, it's in the mind of the beholder. Uh, and, <laughs> so, and, I, and from a conversation we had earlier today, I think that Ed will tell us mm. that um, if there were a drug that could produce that particular neurological response, that would be a response in the mind, in, in the brain, but it would not be an aesthetic experience. It's cocaine, and, and so that uh, that uh, remainder really yeah. is what we want to focus on. What is? It's only a structure. I haven't talked about dynamics. 
Good enough, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is in the dynamics. The, the, the other question, Yuri, would be about how the transformation is made between the, the student for whom the mathematical idea doesn't release the dopamine and the mathematician, quote unquote, who is once upon a time a student, a child who didn't know five, didn't know that there were five bottles on the table or anything like that. Something has changed in the brain so that the apprehension of a beautiful person seems to have a kind of immediacy. And the difficulty what we're dealing with here is that mathematical beauty often is not immediate. It requires a kind of struggle uh, uh, to, to reach it that the mathematician is doing and that the student or the child is doing. And this struggle is the one over F that you remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Namely, the aesthetic is somewhere in between the totally predictable and totally unpredictable. And mm. neuroscience borrowed a term from mm. physics, an ugly one, called complexity. But complexity is where the middle is, which is sort of predictable, but not quite. So mm. this is what makes music so beautiful, that you can predict what's coming next, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And this playfulness, the same thing with paintings, I know everything, is this playfulness, you call it effort, but the same thing. And of course, this is not the same in your brain, in, 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 in my brain, because it is a question of the tens of years of education that you have, because in order to enjoy Bartok, it's not the same than enjoy a drum. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. this level of complexity happens to be an interesting one, because if you calculate the mm -hmm. Fourier transform of music, it's the same as the equation of brain waves or electrical mm -hmm. activity mm -hmm. of the brain. Mm -hmm. So it's not a wonder that the brain resonates with, with particular type of music mm -hmm. because it is the kind of dynamics it makes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Miguel has said that you have to uh, speak English. Okay. Um. Hi. Um, just first, I'm a mathematician and um, I spent most of my career in an engineering school and, and um, had to uh, not focus on beauty. The other thing I want to say first is that I'm not nearly as well read as all of you about beauty and aesthetics. So um, this is going to be much more mundane and, and, and you know, I'm hoping you can add. My question is, you know, whether you guys can tear it apart. Um, so when I talk to students, I can't focus on beauty because these are engineers. And I focus on what I call the craft of mathematics, mm -hmm. where you're not trying to create new mathematics, but you have to do mathematics. And this is very important. It's not just doing formulas or applying procedures. And this is what I realized. So I came up with the following rather mundane, simplistic description of mathematics. It's the use of abstraction and deductive logic to uh, develop new knowledge from old knowledge. So this, you had to start somewhere, but then you can build from there. And um, so, so that's my uh, view of the craft of mathematics. Then, um, so then I, I also had to explain math to um, someone who knew nothing about mathematics. Um, and trying to describe to them this beauty or why there was this wonder when we do mathematics. And the analogy I came up with is that mathematics, so this is very Platonist, is that it's a universe but it's an invisible universe. It only exists in our heads, okay? But it's a universe we all share, okay? There's a commonality and therefore a unity because different mathematicians follow different paths and everything, but then we always come to a common agreement of what's, what's there in the universe. I mean, we may see different things, but when we do it, we see it. In fact, it reminded me of the movie Inception. Um, if you know that one. But anyway, uh, I mean, that's kind mm. of the way I see it. So that, you know, that's, and, and uh, you know, there's consistency in this. So, so the beauty, what's the beauty or the joy? It's when you discover that these different parts of the universe that seem complicated or mysterious want to suddenly understand why it's there. And when you when you explore completely different things, suddenly you realize how they're really part of the same thing. And, and that, to me, is how I see math these days. I, I just want to, you, you said, oh, use the word why, which I think nobody around the table used, but that, in some sense, 
what everybody, all the mathematicians are striving for to answer the why question rather, certainly not the, not the what question, which is somehow uh, uh, beside the point. <clears throat> and uh, do your students understand why when, you're, when they're finished? Or is it why because they can solve the problems? Or why what you told them allows them to solve the problems? Well, um, <coughs> so uh, when, when we were working with weaker students, they had been trained very badly, where they thought they thought we were like the priests, and we were supposed to give them the, the scriptures, and then they would just follow the scriptures and solve the problems. And we had to kind of point out to them that once they knew some basic things, they themselves could put together things and, and do things themselves. And that's why I call it a craft. And, and, uh, and, and there's that too, because the students, I saw them uh, with joy, because uh, we had a way of teaching where they would struggle with a problem, and we would refuse to tell them how to do it. We would simply teach them knowledge that was somehow we knew was necessary. And at some point, the student would suddenly be able to put everything together and see how it all fit together and how it led to what they wanted. And there was this moment of joy in the student that we saw. And, and in fact, the way they expressed it was they'd suddenly look at me and they'd say, go away. <laughs> I got it, and and you know the, these were weak students. It was it, 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 so for me that was a, lo a lot of joy. It, to me that the that that just to underline something you're saying that 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 somehow the greatest praise of mathematics is it's the way in which you could change your mind in which you could find out what you don't know. Exactly, it's building new knowledge out of all. A weak yeah. student like myself yeah. or the mathematicians that are the better students of mathematics want to know how to how to go from not not understanding to understanding it seems to me mathematics is the art of that above all the master art that maybe has taught western philosophy that and maybe all of the world what it meant to, to the understanding understanding or solving solving well you know, let me itself. put it out another thing is that you know, we tend to talk about mathematics as somehow objects, and there was something, some mention of staticness. But mathematics is really a process, it's mm -hmm. doing something. And it's like mm -hmm. you suddenly realize you can do something you couldn't do before. And you could just, you know, and to me that's part of the power and therefore the pleasure of mathematics. You, you develop power. Yeah. I think that's a... Mm -hmm. Thank you all for a fascinating discussion. Um, I wanted to comment on the nucleus of accumbens. If I remember my neuroscience correctly, it's an area that lights up when there is pleasure. And w certainly one aspect of beauty is giving pleasure. Even ugly things can give pleasure. But I would hardly equate it to beauty. Um, and I think that view comes from an anti-Paparian view of science. You sh take things that you think are beautiful, show the nucleus accumbens, lights up, you don't attempt to break it. So if you <laughs> win in a roulette game, you're going to get a lot of action in the nucleus accumbens. But I don't think we'd want to say that that roulette game was beautiful. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so we are, we are smarter than that. We, we know that it's not only the nuclear circumference. I have to make a correction. But there, there is a distinction between simple pleasure and the beauty. So the, the pleasures and those things that light up beauty in cortical areas don't happen when you have pleasure of eating. So this is, I'm sorry to say nuclear circumference is one thing in the brain. But you can separate aesthetic from mm. simple dopamine. Point. We're a long way from finding aesthetics in the brain. Yeah. <laughs> That's another roundtable discussion. That's right. <laughs> well, I know that. The, the, okay, I was going to say that I know that Wittgenstein was opposed to this notion that questions about aesthetics have anything to do with neuroscience or, or psychology. That there is a different sort of language game, and not that it's, it's not that it's nothing or that it has nothing to say, but it. It, there, these are in different sort of dimensions of, uh, of discourse, let's say. I mean, yep. would you agree with that? Yeah. That, that's fine. So I just want to make one comment on what you said about your students. I mean, that is the dream of any uh, teacher of mathematics, 
to turn students into their own agent, uh, as being, mm. to make students their own agents in creating the world of mathematics. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's the craft, which is essential, and then that m moment where the craftsman becomes a free agent, you know? I have a question uh, that requires little interpretations, but you can interpret it, my question. <laughs> uh, uh, if you allow me to, I'm ready, but it's not my... No. <clears throat> Uh, my during experience, uh, like, yeah. my uh, experience during the years, decades, in both in music and science, that was I was lucky <laughs> because of family constellations, show me that some very uh, great uh, difference between the pure structures, pure mathematical structure. Actually, every every structure, in order to the proof that every structure is pure. Uh, is, you need to prove, but uh, one of the very natural proof whether some structure is pure, try to perform some uh, uh, mathematical structure by music or by poetry, because any pure structure, if you substitute uh, by the action any um, science with uh, music sheets or something like that, show, uh, express the harmony and the proportions and the beauty. My question is, until until a pure structure of mathematics is not yet performed, they express the sense of beauty. But it's, now I uh, speak about the, this great difference, but when the pure structure of mathematics begin to perform, they, they express not only sense of beauty, but also sense of sublime. All the great composers make this distinguishment between, you know, the, what is the distance between ugliness and beauty, this is the distance between beauty and sublime. Sublime ever included, included in, uh, in, into itself uh, beauty, but is there something more? Mm. Therefore, why so much, uh, not only passionate, but people is so much impacted, not by very pure uh, uh, mathematical structure, but the performance of mathematics. I can say that the mathematics is uh, part of pure ideas in the mind of God, and when God starts to perform ideas, pure ideas, structures in his mind, appears the universe. When the man starts to... St <laughs> man, uh, begin to perform the pure structure of their narrow mind, they uh, create art. Uh, therefore, because the whole universe, uh, I think the, the question uh, is the mathematics is uh, beauty or beauty is mathematical uh, performance of mathematical structure, this is tautological because whole the universe, the whole universe is, consists from harmony, proportions and symmetry everywhere. The, my question is, uh, because see the, the uh, the sense of beauty, the numbers express the sense of beauty. But the concept, I mean conceptual, uh, 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 the concept doesn't, doesn't express only the sense of beauty. I mean the concepts like pure uh, philosophy or some pure classical poetry. Nevertheless, of the pure structure, they express something uh, different than the, only the sense of beauty. And what is the difference between sense of beauty and sense of sublime? Sublime is, uh, I mean, uh, I finished and I want to say that according to me, sublime is beauty mingled with some bitterness and sufferings. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember the law of great uh, genius of music, Bach uh, confesses that uh, the music is to transform suffering of the content into joy by the beauty of aesthetic shape. Therefore, aesthetic shape transforms ever negative emotions, suffering, bitterness, into beauty which is the highest than pleasure. Because sublime is, there is the, um, uh, gives, uh, I'm finished only one word, uh, beauty gives positive pleasure. But sublime, uh, sublime uh, expressed uh, the sense of sublime, uh, we feel as uh, there is the pleasure different, there is another kind of pleasure that is bound to a passion uh, stronger than satisfaction. And this is the, 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 some mingleness, some synthesis, some mixture between the pleasure and uh, mm. sorrow and dream and some bitterness because all the great uh, genius of music, they, ex they nevertheless, the text, they express the performance of pure structure, they have pure structure per were already performed, express the sense of sublime. And this is, I think,
Yeah, you let him respond. Um, I, I think I was, that's similar to something that I was trying to say that the, and it was brought up several times, that the, that there's a kind of dissonance that's experienced, which would, could be experienced, is experienced by young people, by learners of all ages as painful, and which at a certain point might become pleasurable, or might be recognized as something that's beautiful. I don't, I mean, we haven't systematically tried to separate the, beauty, the beautiful and the sublime in mathematics. So that we haven't tried to separate the moments where you would say, that was a sublime as opposed to beautiful theorem. They, those, they seem to go back and forth, depending on your reaction or the amount of difficulty that you're having, you might judge it to be sublime or to be. There's this other notion about aesthetics that it engages this, the free play of the imagination. Uh, hmm. Moving between, as Hutchinson you referred to earlier, hmm. between let's say chaos and order, and order, mm -hmm. but it's that sort of free play of mm -hmm. the imagination that sort of engenders a feeling of beauty or an appreciation of beauty, and that touches a little bit on what what you were saying. Yeah, and, and there might be there a nice analogy to psychoanalysis, as Ed mentioned earlier, uh, the process and the free play of the imagination, as discussed in Kant in Third, third Critique. Yeah. Uh, uh, the idea there is that you, in fact, uh, individually in that moment make sense of all of the parts of a work of mm -hmm. art into a coherent whole that, that, that takes place not in the work of art, but in your mind. Yeah. And so that is the mind of mm -hmm. the perceiver, uh, right, uh, working uh, with the materials of the art form in a way that is distinctive to that individual and that sensibility at that moment. Yeah. And I can imagine what Ed said a moment ago about the, about the progress of psychoanalysis. There's a kind of taking the parts of a life and fitting them all together into a coherent whole, that aha moment. It's where you, where you say, now I understand, or now I've connected the dots in a way that makes a range of experience coherent and makes it meaningful in the same way in the, in right. the free, the free I think that's why also the word craft is such a nice word, because it gives us notion of being, taking pride in what you're doing and in the process. Yeah. yeah. Right. Could, could I add something that was, that, that's related to that? Uh, Freud praised as the highest virtue courage. He thought that that was more important than intelligence, and it seems to me in this process courage is also required. To have a free play of imagination, especially for a child that's sort of facing school and their uncertainties and the possibility of failure, takes a lot of courage. And the ability to, 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 to face the dissonances and the difficulties, the struggle of imagination, requires courage, and the recognition of that may help the child, or the learner, or the mathematician all understand that there is then hope, because there is courage. You know, M Michael and Barry might disagree with me here, but mathematics seems to me precisely not a free play of imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as opposed to art, right? The artist sits down with a blank sheet of paper and anything can come out, but the mathematician just can't <laughs> write down the mathematician can't just write down. But you can't say the path's a straight one. There's a lot of meandering. So there's and starting so from there's there's a free play, perhaps in some parts of mathematics, when you're starting to try to understand something. But but what I always feel mm -hmm. is 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 that I'm all up against a wall. Mm -hmm. there, there are those walls, aren't yeah. there? Yeah. 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 And but you you may get to it very quickly now too. I mean, because you know, <laughs> no, because you're so accomplished and you know. Well, you're always right at your wall. That. I mean, you're always at the wall, at the yeah. rock face. But Evner, I want to go with Stravinsky just very quickly. Uh, you know, uh, he said, "Give me a blank manuscript paper and an ink pen, and I'm paralyzed. I can't do a thing. Yeah, Give I, me a single interval, you know, C up to A flat, and he said mm -hmm. I can fly." And so there's a sense. No, I, I take it back what I said about art. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, fine. It, it, it's not just a free for all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I was uh, reflecting on the Sanskrit language, and uh, which you brought up the word ananda. And uh, in, in the Sanskrit language, um, there's the words sukha and dukkha, and they are pleasure and pain. Uh, ananda, <coughs> joy, is as the other gentleman was suggesting. There's there's a big difference between sukha and dukkha, pleasure and pain, and joy. Joy is something much beyond that. Hmm. Um, now, um, uh, um, the, wor the word ananda is part of a longer Sanskrit word called sat chit ananda. There's three, three it's, a, it's a tripartite. Sat is consciousness, chit is knowledge, and ananda is joy. And sat chit ananda in Sanskrit is said to be the nature of Brahman. Brahman is the unity. 
It's the one. It's, it's the self. It's mm -hmm. yourself. So there's, there's another, yet another mm -hmm. level jump up. Mm -hmm. So as Homo sapiens, we're, we're going through these experiences mm -hmm. as students painfully having our sukkahs and our dukkahs <laughs> <laughs> and then our moments of... And all that shit. Yeah. And all that yeah. shit. <laughs> and then occasionally a, a, a flash of ananda, mm -hmm. of joy, or through, through consciousness, uh, through, through knowledge, mm -hmm. through math or whatever, and moving towards the sublime unity. Um, hmm. And I just throw that out, uh, not so much as a question, but if anything mm -hmm. comes back from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the difficulty seems to be how to turn the pleasure and pain, or mostly pain, that people experience when they think of mathematics. You know, the, the broad majority of people that would like to think it's beautiful, but ex whose experience is mainly painful, and how to show the path that's there. I think that, the, use the word flying, I mean, it, someone once said that a poem is when words begin to fly, that is, that they leave the ground. They leave the ground and you have this exhilarating sense that they're, that they're moving in another dimension. To whatever extent, I mean, that seems to be part of the nature of the joy that, that you were speaking about that's, that's been experienced before, which could be kind of terrifying at first, the idea of flying and not being on the ground, but the moments where one hears words that are winged words, that, that, that fly, the idea that that could happen with mathematical concepts, even the possibility, even the thought that that might be possible, is already raises one above the ground a little bit, and one wants to say like, okay, show me how, show me how to fly. Being raised above the ground changes your viewpoint. And that's, and that's so important in mathematics, so you're usually looking for some overview of things that would otherwise be considered separate, and now you see them all as a, as a territory. And that's partly abstraction, to go back to that word, is that abstraction well, I mean, helps one to fly. But then yeah. what happens it to the detail? To, yeah. <laughs> Pardon yeah. me. Then what happens to the details? Often uh, yeah. you, somebody comes up with an abstraction, that uh, in that makes unnecessary the life's work of several mm. generations, <laughs> <laughs> and then what, what is, and we are all looking forward. We can, we all know that that's going to happen to uh, to what we've done. And that abstraction will be a concrete object, which will be later abstracted mm -hmm. right. in its own right. But the, the struggle of that seems important. There was a, once a man who loved to watch the butterflies hatch from cocoons, but he was always very moved at the struggle. That some would die. They were obviously in agony as they were going through it. So he, he had the idea of using a scalpel to make an incision to help the butterfly to emerge. It worked very well. The butterfly emerged from the cocoon. It, it, it flapped its wings. There was only one problem. It couldn't fly. And so somehow that's part of the, what, it, what it means to, <laughs> that you would have to crash, you would have to try to make an abstraction, and it would be completely wrong, and isn't that the nature of what it is you're, to You're insisting on the pain, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm insisting on the flight. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, okay. So I have a comment that just seems to me to be crying out to be made, um, especially in New York City among psychoanalysts. And what we're talking about is the quest for beauty within mathematics, and that reduces somewhat to a question of, is math beautiful? And what I'm drawn to as an answer is um, Woody Allen's comment about whether sex is dirty. And the answer is, if it's done right. <laughs> Pretty good. That should be our next panel. Is mathematics dirty? <laughs> That's a whole other. That's a whole other route. Too. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I have a, a few thoughts about listening to this wonderful discussion, which lead to a question. I think 
Uh, one thought is the question, uh, psychoanalysts, of course, of which I am one, <coughs> are obsessed with the idea of meaning. And I don't think there's been much mm. reference in the discussion mm. to whether mathematics has a meaning or whether particular mathematical ideas or facts have a meaning. Mm. And uh, the other thought I had was that if I'm, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not also not a philosopher or a mathematician, but if I'm not mistaken, when you get to Kant's uh, critique of judgment and his discussion of aesthetics, he not only says that there's some kind of inner aesthetic uh, uh, measuring stick or, or uh, sense, but he also says that, it, that in order to find something beautiful, it has to be universalizable. So you have to imagine, at least, that, that in talking with <laughs> your fellow humans, you could convince them. If, if you had the right circumstances. And um, the third, uh, well, yeah, regard, just mm -hmm. parenthetically, regarding the question of meaning, I think there, there are certain mathematical objects which have meaning for all of us almost <coughs> automatically, natural numbers, uh, conic sections, um, you know, other like spheres, <laughs> things that have, have holes in them and so forth. But when you become more abstract and more technical and more uh, specialized, then I'm not sure what the meaning is. And then there is an anecdote. Uh, I, I knew a very old mathematician who, who was hoping to live to see the proof of the Riemann hypothesis. And he never did live to see it. He himself had, had uh, worked on a version uh, of the Riemann hypothesis for algebraic varieties, but he never lived to see it proved in, its, in Riemann's original form. It raises the question, why is the zeta function uh, so uh, beautiful <laughs> to mathematicians? Mm -hmm. and, and why are they so interested in where the zeros of the zeta function fall on the complex plane? Why is that more interesting than other questions? Well, he did live, this mathematician did live to see the solution, the proof of the four color theorem. So I, I made a point of asking him, well, you know, what do you think of this new discovery? He was also very, already very old and not doing mathematics himself. And he said, oh, it's not interesting. This proof is not interesting. The, theor the, pro the theorem is not interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not going to lead anywhere. It's, it just it wasn't interesting to him. Here's my question. Is it possible that the question of beauty in mathematics is a question of um, culture? that there is a culture of, of mathematicians, especially really good ones and great ones, who, who have the right mm -hmm. to define what is beautiful in mathematics among themselves and also educating the public. Define wouldn't be enough. They would have to feel it, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, mm -hmm. Whether you're a Kantian and believe that uh, Beauty is a universally subjective uh, notion, but whatever. It's, whoever you are, it's initially a feeling. And um, yes, <laughs> the answer is yes about the feeling. Uh, the, uh, the, other, the other issue about um, the Riemann hypothesis, which were, what you... I don't want to get into that. No, sorry. It's, it's, no, it's, it's very too interesting complicated. In, the, in the culture but question. Too technical. What? In the culture question. Whether there's the a culture of mathematician which has something to say about what's yeah. beautiful and not. Seen from another planet, uh, what mathematicians are constantly doing, as professional mathematicians, is uh, defining the contours of the field by writing letters of recommendation, by <laughs> editing <laughs> journals, <laughs> by, uh, by deciding to give lectures about one thing rather than another. It, it, and now it's impossible. This is when you try. It's hard enough to define mathematics. I think it's I I even harder or to uh, say to, to what extent mathematics is is uh, the creation of a particular stratum of, of society. That is to say, the mathematicians, <laughs> and to what extent it, it corresponds to something that would be there in any case. 
and, and not just the mathematicians. I mean, you can have you can use your hermeneutic of suspicion here. And I, I had a friend who used this, a mathematician, who would say, "The definition of beautiful mathematics is what the what the professors at Harvard and, and Stanford, you know, in Chicago, is what they say is beautiful." And uh, you know, what I the implication what I'm working on is different from that. But yeah. but, but, that, uh, but that it was a feel. I'm going going back to something Barry just said. There, there was a feeling rather than a meaning. And that you were asking about meaning, and it seemed as if, as with music, I mean, I'm going back to that. It's a first of all, there's a feeling, or the, the, this this a strong feeling in front of nature is what Cezanne said was that what painting was for him, the strong feeling, and the feeling for mathematical objects. I don't know if that's culture. It, it, at least the claim would be that this is the most available across cultures because it is having to do with objects that are apprehensible, I guess, even by extraterrestrial or android-type beings. So it would be the least cultural then. Mm. If, I, if I'd so. like to know what the people who proved the four-color theorem oh, thought about it. about the four-color theorem? The reason why the four-color theorem is the proof is, let's say, unsatisfying, is um, one proves that there are a finite number of cases that you have to examine, but that mm. finite number of cases is very large. And a computer examines them. So that's why people are not happy about it. On the other hand, <laughs> there are um, two mathematicians there, um, uh, differential geometers, and um, Kernheimer and Rofka, have reconsidered the four color. The four color problem is a, is, a, is a simple, single question which seems to have nothing to do with uh, very much in the rest of mathematics. But just recently, people have replaced the four color problem with something in three dimensional geometry, which is I mean, not replaced it, but if you could prove something in three-dimensional geometry, you would have a really good proof of the four-color problem. So that become, makes it, that forces it part of a much larger, uh, let's say, combined effort hmm. having to do with churn simons invariance and things like that. But uh, it's now no longer an isolated hmm. particular thing. And that's a funny thing that happens with a lot of these isolated, marvelous problems. For example, there's something called the Kakaya problem, which I can tell you. You take a needle, okay, and you want to rotate it 360 degrees, but cover on the, on the table, but cover the smallest amount of area on the table that you can cover. Right? Well, the natural thing is you just twirl it, and then you get uh, an area of pi times the diameter of the needle, the, the length of the needle. needle. Um, but Kakaya suggested that there might be sort of funnier ways, instead of just rotating, you might go in this direction and then go back in that direction and then go in the, and, and get some weird uh, way of turning that needle 360 degrees and you would cover less of the table. Okay, he conjectured this. And it was finally proven that you can do this covering a small amount of the table as you want. Okay, now that was <laughs> standard, regarded as one of these isolated single problems. You know, what can you do? And um, no, it's now, it's now a, a piece of a really interesting, um, very general theorem about uh, norms, about um, L2 norms. Mm -hmm. So, it's very hard to have an isolated, mm -hmm. independent problem in mathematics. Mm -hmm. There's a, on the question of meaning, uh, there's a, uh, uh, I'll just mention them one last time, I promise. Uh, something that Wittgenstein uncovered is actually, I think, quite interesting here. Um, we normally think of the primary repository of meaning as being in language. And then we ask, well, mm -hmm. how would mathematics have meaning from a linguistic point of view? Wittgenstein, in a section of the Philosophical Investigations, turned it around, and he said, imagine a society that has only the numbers one through five. 
And in that world, you say one, one plus one, that's okay, foundational. You know, two plus two is four. That's pushing the edges of what we, you know, three plus two, you know, only the most in advance math. math, math right, right, right. And, and then somebody says, how about, you know, some genius comes in, how about five plus four? And they say, that's an incoherent question, right? <laughs> and so, so in that world, right, Wittgenstein asks, well, would the number five have the same meaning in that culture as it does for us? And the answer is obviously no. What, he, what he's doing is saying, well, words function like that too. So we can learn something about word meaning by looking at number meaning, if you will. And that is a matter of seeing a number in a very, very complex set of relations, part of which you can articulate in a moment, part of which you can't. Uh, and, and he was suggesting there that atomistic conceptions of word meaning or invariant word meaning, mm -hmm. the idea that words have meanings of themselves and they carry that meaning invariantly across context is a misbegotten analogy, is a kind of scientific picture that's out of control. He's saying words don't work that way because we know that numbers don't work that way. So the meaning gets turned around in an interesting way there. Well, um, uh, a quick comment, just a... Uh, on craft, uh, uh, I'm a magician who has a lot of magician, uh, mathematician friends, and um, so I just wanted to speak up for craft. And one time I was talking to Sylvan Capel, and he said, "I think you're right on that craft thing about math because one time Israel Gafant was uh, with a student at Rutgers who was spinning his wheels and just worrying about a problem and not working on it, and finally he yelled at him, "Mathematics is not head work; it's hand work." Hmm. And um, then with results, uh, uh, talking about um, your comment about roulette, we shouldn't forget Ed Thorpe's work with Claude Shannon on roulette that led to uh, quantitative investment in Wall Street and <coughs> has therefore blessed mathematics in ways that it couldn't imagine, <laughs> so uh, in a beautiful way. And, um, and then um, I wanted to bring, I've been a teacher's assistant to one of Barry's students, Manjul Bhargava at Princeton this semester, and he's a friend now for many years through John Conway. And, um, I, want, I, and I know John through the friends of um, Martin Gardner. And Martin Gardner seemed to do all this work on the unity of mathematics mm -hmm. by writing articles that uh, kind of broke down J.H. Hardy's divisions between pure applied and recreational math that was written for political reasons. And so I just wanted to, it's kind of going, jumping from beauty back to unity. And to me, it's just as amazing as a magician, a guy who trained in philosophy at U of C and, um, and then worked as a magician, really used that to write papers that help uh, unify math in, in a very real way, it seems, for many years in the last part of the last century. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we will finish. <laughs> Thanks to the audience for yeah, those, are great yeah, questions. Questions. those are great wow. questions. Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> no, we want to know.